3 through 6. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born again when he is old? And Amos asked him, can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of Spirit is Spirit. So, new birth. Jesus is the one who uses the phrase, born again. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ and believe in him for the forgiveness of our sins, we are born again. It's not just Baptist language. It's Jesus' language. <laughs> you guys are all born again believers if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for your eternal security. Um, and what a gift. What a gift that is. But that's where this living hope piece starts. If that belief is not there, if you're wrestling kind of with that belief in your own life, I want to urge you tonight to go ahead and believe. Um, he is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. It says in John 14, 6, he came for us. That song, Reckless Love, just reminds me of the fight um, that God has in him to come for each one of us. And I want you all to know tonight that if that decision has not been made in your life, I want to urge you to make that decision to go and step out in faith and trust him because this living hope is what comes through that. This living hope we're going to talk about comes through salvation, through faith in Christ alone, not in what I can do, not in going to church, not in my baptism, not in my good works. It does not rest in that. Our salvation rests in Christ alone. This new birth, this being born again, comes through faith in Christ and nothing else. Now because of our faith in Christ, as we, after we place faith in Christ, He will work through us. He will use us. He will work in our hearts. He will grow us up in the faith. We're all in different places on that journey. But before we can move on and talk about this living hope, we have to have made that decision in our life to place our faith completely in the one and only Savior, Jesus. Um, I was a lifeguard for several years. I started uh, as a lifeguard when I was 16 or 17 year old, years old at the city pool and um, did it for years. I ended up getting, being hired at an inner city Christian sports camp as a college student and I was um, the head lifeguard and in charge of that pool there. Now this just wasn't just any pool, okay? This was a huge it had a blob, I was going to say a blob, <laughs> it had a blob in it, which I know many of you have seen the blob out in some of us weeks, like Gloria or Queen, um, I don't know if Queen has a blob, Queen has a blob, yeah, the blob, the big pillow of air that you get to jump on, it had a blob, it had these, this platform that you jumped on, um, monkey rings that you could, you could go across the water on, it had the aqua tramp, it had, um, so the aqua tramp, the platform, and the blob were all in the 12-foot. And then we had three other things going on over here in the 4-foot. And as the head lifeguard up in the head chair, you get to point to each thing when it's their turn to go. And you have one guard across, and then you have one roaming guard. So that's how this was set up in the um, I was in the head guard chair, and a little boy stepped up onto the platform. And I've been a lifeguard for years, um, but had, had not encountered this yet. Um, he stepped gingerly to the end, looked down, and then took a big jump and just jumped into the water. And I watched him sink to the bottom, and I watched him push really hard off the bottom and come back up almost halfway, a little over halfway up. And then I watched him stop in the middle. And I just looked, and I watched him start to struggle like this. My body going in and out, in and out. He wasn't coming to the top of the water, he was going to the bottom of the pool. Woo! Um, I did the three tweet thing, jumped in, and it was time to put my skills to practice. After five years of being a lifeguard, never having a USA, here's a deep water save. Um, he was fighting at first before I jumped in, and then he did this in the middle of the water. So I jumped in, grabbed him out, this little, oh, this little thing they trained us in lifeguard training was perfect. I tucked the sausage, the red lifeguard sausage, under him and him under my arm and yanked, no, no, no. Sorry, how do you do it? I don't remember how I did it. The sausage was up top. I yanked and it propelled us both up to the top. It worked like a gym. I was just so grateful for that. Um, and we came out of the water and was coughing. Then I tucked it under his arm and we swam to the side. I tell you that story to tell. 
tell you that um, Pasha gave me such a clear picture of salvation. He was struggling in the middle of the water, and when he gave up, and he put his arms up like this, and I jumped in to say, and that's us, guys. We were dead in the water without our Savior to come and sweep us out. We can work all we want to. The harder we work, the lower we'll go. He loves you. He blew the whistle. John the Baptist blew the whistle. He came onto the scene of earth at the perfect time, the scriptures say. And he came for each one of you. You need to know that this was you. And had he not brought you up out of that water, you would have died. You would have died. And he came and he swept you and he brought you out. I want to remind you of that good news because that's the foundation of our living hope. And I hope that visual will stay with you. The more working, the more fighting we do, you're trying to be good enough. Just, it doesn't work. He came. He came. He lifted you out of sin, of eternal death and darkness. He did that. And when you, when you believe that, you are saved. You are born again. Don't doubt it for a second. Okay, so back to our verse. Um, this living hope. So I did, I, I'm not a scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I did study this just for you guys. Um, so hope. We're going to define hope. For all you note takers, type A's out there. We're going to um, define hope as confident expectation. Now, at the culture, we use this word really flippantly at times. I hope you have a good day. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I hope everything's okay. Um, but we're going to define hope as confident expectation. Our hope as believers is based on a promise. This is the promise that changes everything. There's nothing casual or common about it at all. And I want you to remember this, that our hope is only as good as the promise that it's tied to. If we're hoping in and a promise given by the God of all creation. This is unfailing hope. This is unshakable hope. This is living hope. Not only for big picture eternity, but for day to day facing of struggles. Okay? Um, our Savior promises us in John 16, 33 that we will have trouble in this world and he reminds us to take heart in the midst of that trouble because he has overcome it. You will not get out of this life without facing hardship. Many of us in this room know that well. The only things that separate us, the only things that separate us from each other's pain is the time and the type of wound. You will have pain. You will have suffering. You will have hardship. It would be worth our time to seek how to faithfully walk through that, wouldn't it? There is we, you know, many times we just get so caught up in the good and the blessing of it all and the resurrection that we forget about the cross. We want the resurrection and the healing and we want the, the good side and we forget about the suffering, not only on the cross, but the suffering that God put himself to when he wrote himself in flesh and came down and lived on this earth. Can you imagine being the God of heaven, having all power and all authority and setting it aside? Wrapping in flesh and living for 33 years, completely dependent on human beings at first. Living for 33 years, and then we have the suffering on the cross. And ultimately, the turning away from the face of his father, which, thank God, we don't have to go through because of his sacrifice and because of his um, resurrection. in this life, 
we can understand that Jesus told us that we would, and we can know that he will walk with us through it, and he will empower us to live life with it, okay? If he doesn't deliver us from it, he's going to walk with us through it. This uh, hope is further described as a living hope. The Greek word here is zao. It means to live, to breathe, to be among the living, not lifeless or dead. Some things that some of us have encountered have threatened to steal that life from us. That living and breathing, the darkness that we've encountered in our stories has threatened to stop it all together. I know it has for me. Um, and this living hope says that that is not going to happen. I know you might want to quit. I know it might be really, really hard. But no, when you're a child of God and when you're Jesus' child, that's not going to happen. This is a living hope. Because of this hope, we can breathe, we can live. Hope in and of itself doesn't cause me to live, but as we talked about before, the hope of the believer is tied to a promise, the promise of the gospel. It is the confident expectation of the fulfillment of that promise. That is our hope, and nothing in this world can touch it. I'm going to flip over to John chapter 6 if you want to turn with me. It was June 1st, 2017, when our five year old son became very sick. He started to have seizures. He was otherwise healthy, no known health issues. And I know some of you guys know the story half, probably a third of the room that you guys have helped our family walk through this. Probably most of the room have prayed for us, and I'm so thankful. So thankful for those things that you have done and said and prayed and has carried our family through this time with Judah. Anyway, he started having seizures, and we very quickly knew at the emergency room that it was not a good um, situation, and we were flown to Children's Hospital. Um, we had no idea at the time, but we would be there for a very, very, very long time. To say that um, the days are slow, oh my goodness, this time was so slow and so very painful. Um, the questions that I had for God ranged from why? Why me? Why him? Who are you? Um, um, that's not a question, that's a statement. That's all the story for a minute. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. My husband and I have the privilege of serving in ministry. We've been serving for summer in summer fest two weeks for 13 years now. Monty's has been 15, but we got married 13 years ago, and I've walked with the Lord for a long time. When he allowed my son to be taken down in this dramatic fashion, you can bet your bottom dollar. I had some questions, and I was very, very angry. It's not supposed to be this way. I serve you. I've given you my life. This isn't supposed to happen. Why didn't you protect me? Why aren't you protecting us? Do you even love me? Do you love me? I was so wrapped up in the pain of watching my five-year-old, watching the doctors come in and say, I'm so sorry. We have our biggest guns on him, and they are not working. Lord, we're picking. Our faith is where we know our Almighty God can deliver. Heal him, Lord. Come heal him. We're, we're anointing him with oil. The elders are in the room praying over him. We believe it's not happening. Day after day after day. I remember one day I was driving into Pittsburgh and I was weeping. I always had my worship music on because I wanted to run from God because I knew he had allowed it. I couldn't. I knew he was the only way that I was going to get through this. The only way. I would play my worship music to prepare me to step into that hospital. Because not only do we have our son who were just all the unknowns of that situation and the pain, but you're walking into a place where there are multiple families in the same position. 
So we wanted to be spiritually prepared to minister. We figured, okay, God, you have us here to do some work. So we're going to do it, and then we're going to be all right, and we're going to go home. <laughs> Let's do this. That's got to be why you have us here. We're sharing the gospel with medical staff. Three nurses come to faith in our first three weeks at Children's in Pittsburgh. Hallelujah. I can praise God for that now, but at that time, it just wasn't worth it to me. Not to see him laying there the way that he was and suffering the way that he was. I know that you can understand. I was driving on my way there as I did day after day after day, and I was emotional, upset, crying, just listening to some Lauren Daigle and worshiping. And I just, I became angry. And I said, Lord, who are you? And I shouted it out of him. I said, who are you? And I couldn't believe that it had come from my lips. Because I know who he is. I know what the scriptures teach. I believe that he loves me. But I was in a place that I had to shout it out. Everything that was going on around me didn't make any sense. Can you relate? What? I don't understand. And, you know, suffering on a large scale, that's one thing to try to come to grips with, with the sovereignty of God and the, and the suffering that you see going on around you. When it enters your own front door in such a powerful way, it's a whole other thing to grapple with. And I am thankful because the wrestling that I've, that I've done with God has only allowed me to grow in knowledge of Him. If you're wrestling with Him right now, you can know that there is great purpose, and know it may not ever be worth it, but there's a bigger plan that we don't understand in our human understanding. Okay? There's a bigger plan that we don't understand that He does. He is perfectly good. There is no darkness in Him at all. So when things like this come into our lives, and darkness threatens to tear us apart, he says, no. No. It's not going to tear you over. Yeah, we're going to have some talks and we're going to wrestle. But I don't leave. I don't leave. And I never will. And I hope that you will know that in your struggle. He will never leave you or forsake you. He is with you through every step of the way. So I cried that out and I was beside myself immediately. He brings Psalm 139 to my mind. Praise God for His Word. It is so powerful, ladies. Praise God. He, it has saved my life throughout this journey. So the Holy Spirit immediately brings this to mind. Where can I escape your spirit? Verse 7, chapter 139. Psalm, verse 7, chapter 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle in the western limits, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. When I said, who are you? It's because I was frustrated. I was done. I was done. Fine. If you're not going to heal my son, I'm done. That was my attitude. And God, in his loving kindness and great patience and mercy met me there. And in another scripture, he reminds me here, first of all, that I can't run from him. We can't run. We can't run. We can't run. And we, and we can want to, but really, as I said before, the only way that we can face these things are with God and his strength. Because I can tell you right now, I would not be standing here without the spirit of the living God, without this living hope that we're unpacking this weekend. I can tell you that right now, and I know there are some people in this audience who know that as well. We would not be sitting together if it weren't for the spirit of the living God. He will carry you. He is carrying you. He will carry you through whatever you face. Um, and then immediately after, uh, where can I go from your spirit? We're going to flip back over to John 6. I'm kind of off my nose a little bit. Sorry, Rebecca. Um, because when I wanted to run, immediately the scripture comes to mind. Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And you know what had happened right before that all unfolded? You can see the story in, starting in verse 60 through verse 
68, I guess, is how far we'll go. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But what had happened was, Jesus had just taught about eating his body and drinking his blood. And many people were turned off by that. Oh, Jesus, you went a little too far. <laughs> a lot of people, says a lot of people turned away. This is a hard teaching, the scriptures say. Who can accept it? Many people left that day. And so he turned to the twelve. He turned to his friends and he said, what about you? Will you leave me also? Oh, I've heard of those words. And Simon Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. I'm telling you tonight that when God is teaching a hard lesson to you, when you're when you're facing something hard, he understands that it's hard. He understands that you can't wrap your mind around the pain. You can't wrap your mind around the loss. You can't wrap up your mind around, why do I have this new struggle? Why do I have to, you can't wrap your mind around the why behind it. And he knows that. And he is there to carry and walk with you through it. He has the words of eternal life. He is the only one who can sustain us in these things. I remember we would go down to, I think it was the fourth floor, there was a place called Zach's Playroom. My kids, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I have a big family. I have seven children now. <laughs> At the time, we had six. And um, one was in the hospital, so my other children would come and visit, and we would sometimes go down to Zach's playroom. And we had friends visiting with us, and we would um, go down, and at this particular time, I was just doing a normal, everyday thing, walking to the bathroom. And the Lord says to me, I want you this close to me always. <laughs> I walk into the bathroom, you know, kind of stop me in my tracks. I want you this close to me always. How close was I then? I couldn't get out of bed without opening the scriptures. I could not put my feet on the floor without hearing a word from God. I was in the Psalms. I was reading in Job at the time. Perfect timing, right? God knew that. He knew how that would encourage my heart. He knows how it would encourage your heart. And I was also reading through the Psalms. I don't know if y'all are super familiar with the Psalms, but there's a lot of lamenting that goes on in the Psalms. There's a lot of pain that David expresses. There are a lot of things that the psalmists express that are very, very relatable to what we face in this life. You can find comfort there. If you open up the Psalms and just start reading from Psalm 1, you will find comfort in the Word of God. He will meet you there. So when he said that to me, I was like, okay, well, I can't survive right now. I can't get up out of bed without reading your word. And wow, tears. Oh, really? <laughs> Jeez, what have I been doing? Um, he wants, and I'm not, I'm, he wants us all as close. How do I know that? Well, a kind of funny verse in Jeremiah talks about the closeness of the loincloth. I'm not going to reference it, I don't remember, but that's kind of that close. <laughs> like, all of it are privacy, okay? <laughs>
17. Thank you. Let's turn there because I don't want to misquote. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Jesus prays for all the believers down here. So we're going to go verses 20 through 23 here. I pray not only for these, meaning his disciples, he just finished praying for his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their message. That's us. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us so the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made complete, completely one so that the world may know you have sent me. That's how close God wants us to be. He wants us to be one. Yeah. He wants our hearts to be his heart. Wherever you are on your journey, know that he wants you to come to him. He wants to be with you as much as can be possible, okay? And the more that we're with our Father, the more we're able, we're empowered to walk in his will. In our pain, there are so many things that we can face in this life that... We feel like we can't walk through. Um, and there are things that, that we face that we think we can walk through and we give it a go. And like, oh, whoops, no, I couldn't. <laughs> we kind of mess it up <laughs> a little bit. But he wants us this close always. I, I will never forget that. And I haven't forgotten that. And he, uh, by his grace and mercy, has kept me close. And after we left the hospital, we had a long inpatient rehab stay. And this entire time, my family was kind of just, everybody just up in the air, everybody kind of everywhere. I know a lot of you guys spent a lot of time with a couple of my children at one time or another during that time. But for me, I was just in a deep, deep, deep darkness. And I, he met me there every day in his word. He met me there every day through other believers, texting me, emailing me just at the right time, um, and encouraged my heart moment by moment, day by day. When we recognized that we were leaving the hospital with a different son than we had come in with, um, it wasn't what we expected. We prayed for healing, and I'll be very honest with you. I had talked with God about Judah going home. And I put that in his hands by the second week we were there, which I never thought. That was a work of the Holy Spirit in my heart. I never thought I could do it. I remember telling him, Lord, you take him home. I'm sitting on the foot of his bed. I'll trust you with that. I'll trust you with that. Lord, if you heal him. With that. The other option, I didn't really have a conversation with him about, which is the option we're currently in, which is this. Our son is still with us. Praise God. I tell you, when he was first sick, I battled for that boy's life in the emergency room in prayer. I cried out to God. He saved my son. He did. And that was his intention all along. But um, we have a son now who has a lot of debilitating disabilities. He can't talk with us. He can't eat. He doesn't walk. He doesn't play. I do want you to know that he is having a very good week right now. Just an update because I know a lot of you pray for him. But um, his seizures are down right now. He is nodding, yes, and shaking his head for no. We are ecstatic about that and praising Jesus about that. Um, so continue to keep praying for us. God is, God is so much at work. So much at work on all of this. But anyway, we came home with a, a very different different situation than we expected. And I remember each time we transitioned, like we transitioned from the hospital to inpatient rehab, I was just I was so disappointed. My expectations were different. 
And I was, I, I was devastated by that. And he met me there each time and reminded me that he was doing a good work. And I know you guys, I know it's over, it's over quoted, but in Romans 8, 28, he says that all things are working together for our good and his glory. Um, that's a super paraphrase, but um, that's the meaning of it. And he reminded me of that day by day, moment by moment, when I needed it. And he reminded me too that in John 10, 27, he says that I am his sheep and I know his voice, so I don't have to doubt what he has said in his word. He's given us promises and encouragement in his word, and even when what I'm looking at doesn't seem to be lining up with what I read, it's because it's a spiritual thing, okay? There's a, there's a spiritual world and there's a physical world. Our God is a God of both. But there's a lot going on that we don't see and that we don't understand. And that's hard, but that's okay. I love the example that Priscilla Shire uses of the ocean. GCG says there are some things that we know about the ocean. There's a lot more that we don't know about the ocean, which is very similar to what the chief of, the, of neurology told us at Children's. We know this much about the human brain. And I'm sorry, but we don't know what's going on with Judah. And we don't know that we can, we can figure it out. Um, but anyway, about the ocean. So there's so much more about it that we don't know, that we can't explore, but we know some things, right? We know some things about the ocean. We know that it's salty. We know that it's wet. We know that it's humongous, right? There are some things that we can know about God, right? We can know that he's good. And I have wrestled to find his goodness in this, and I have found it. I have found that we can know that he loves us. He loves us. We can know he is sovereign and in control. When it looks like things are being run away with by the enemy or by life or whoever you want to credit it to, by, by darkness, whatever you want to credit it to, he still reigns over that. He still reigns over that. He hasn't lost control. He didn't say, oh no, what happened to Judah? You know, thank God. He knew and he had gone before us and set things up at the hospital. He, he was all around us. There were things that happened within that hospital. Not only people coming to faith, conversations being had, but hundreds of people being challenged in their own faith because of our son, seeking God because of what our son was going through. And God was doing something much bigger than we ever could have imagined. He still is. He still is, which is so cool to be a part of, and humbling to be a part of. Um, okay, I'm, I skipped over something I want to talk to you all about, so let's turn to John chapter 6, verses 25 through 29. But that picture of the ocean has always come back to me, you know? I can know these things about God. I don't have to doubt His goodness. I don't have to doubt His love when bad things happen. I don't have to doubt these truths that I know about God. There's so much more that I don't know. He's incomprehensible. He's very mysterious. There are things that I don't ever have to give up. There are truths that I can know. Does that make sense? I thought that was a great picture. So John chapter 6, verses 25 through 29. In fact, just a So Jesus has just performed uh, some miracles. He has fed 5,000. The disciples have seen him walk on water. And we're going to start in verse 25 of chapter 6. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? They knew he had been the boat. They saw him the night before. How did you get here? Jesus answered, I assure you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set the seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. But what sign are you going to do so that we may believe in you? They asked, what are you going to perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to
to them. I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. I'm going further than I planned, so I'm just going to stop. <laughs> We're going to get too deep into this. I want to talk about this first conversation he has with these people, okay? Um, when we were in the hospital, we were begging for signs all the time. Lord, show us today. Move today. Do something today. Perform, perform, perform. Um, when I read this story during that time, I was like, oops, sorry. <laughs> The good news of the gospel. 
people that we can believe and be saved by. Nothing can touch our souls. Nothing can touch our souls. Nothing can touch what we have, the inheritance that First Peter talks about. Nothing can touch that. Oh, things can touch things in this life. Don't put your hope in the things of this life. And people, and buildings, and homes, and cars, and careers, and children. Don't put your hope there. You will be disappointed. You will be broken. And it will hurt. Don't put your hope there. Put your hope in the things of eternity. Invest in the things of eternity. We all need help knowing what those things are, what that might look like in our lives. Let's do it together. We can figure it out. God will lead us. But let's take our hope from things that we can see and put it in the things of eternity, the promise that God has given. There were so many families that we encountered where we were in the picky with Judah. And we were looking by the, only the power of the Holy Spirit. We were looking for opportunities to pray with people, to share that, that God was with them, any truth that he would lead us to share with anybody that we could. And we met this precious, precious young family. I could tell it wasn't good. The, uh, the waiting room was packed with friends and family. And I had a conversation with the young mom and her young husband. They had to be in their mid-20s. And I asked, you know, what's going on? We've been there probably two, two and a half months at that point. So we were, it was our home. <laughs> um, and she told me what had happened. And her four-month-old baby girl was on my support. Oh. So she told me what had happened. We prayed with she and her husband that night. We actually knew somebody, like had a mutual acquaintance, which was really cool. But we prayed with them that night and um, came back the next day. And she had told me the day before that they were going to see if um, her baby girl had brain, brain waves. And so I was anxiously coming. Oh, and they were in the room right next to us, by the way. So like... I peeked in and seen what was going on too, and I kind of connected the dots there. Anyway, details, details. Um, I came in to the waiting room the next day looking for her, hoping um, for um, a positive report. And I met her eyes, and she looked down, and she shook her head. And so I quickly walked over to her and held her as she wept. And she said, the family's coming in tomorrow. We're going to tell her goodbye. Lord, where are you? Where are you? Oh, he was there. And he, yeah, he was there. So the next morning I had an, an urgency to get to her. I don't know this woman. <laughs> I had an urgency to get to her. And so I went wandering around. She wasn't in the room anymore. Where is this family? I've seen the nurses. That's really private. They can't really tell. So I just wandered the hallways. Um, and I found them. It was quiet. The lights were dim. Lots of sniffling going on in the room. And I walked in. And Tiana was laying on the bed with her baby girl. Four months old, in the process of just telling her goodbye. She was already gone. It was hard for her to let go. She stood up and gave me a hug and wept. And I remember all I could say was, sweet baby, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I remember then backing away from her and letting her and her husband, and just being there with them, just being present. And I remember thinking, why am I saying I don't want to say this. No. This is hard. This is too hard, you know. Well, about a year after Judah's um, initial entrance into the hospital, I got an email from Tiana.
And she says to me in the email, Hey, Kendra, it's Deanna from Children's Hospital. I'm not sure if you remember me or not, but we were in the room right next door to each other. And my daughter passed on September 4th. It's been on my heart to message you and say thank you for months now. The day my daughter passed, I laid on that bed with her, and I had convinced myself that I was not getting up from beside her. I said to myself, Lord, I need you to send someone. Because if you don't, I will stay. And you walk through the door. I just wanted to say that God used you to answer my prayer. And I was able to get up out of that bed and hug you. Because God used you to answer my prayer. And then she goes on just saying two kind words and, and being so thankful. So in, in our lives, a lot of us are going to face hard things, and we're going to need people to come alongside us to help us stand up, to help us get out of bed. Okay? I don't know what kind of bed anyone is lying in right now, but I know we all have disappointments. And some of us have deep devastation. And my prayer is that in this St. Paul's family, in this group of friends in this room, that we will be able to walk alongside each other in that and be able to be a picture of that living hope that we have in Christ to each other. That because somebody walks into your room, that you can get up off the bed. I'm standing here. I can't believe I'm standing here. There were so many days that I couldn't get out of bed, but the power of God is real. It's real. It's real. Every word in this book is true. The hope that we have in him is untouchable.
small groups to answer a couple questions together, okay? Thank you for letting me share with you. It's a blessing to my heart. Father, I am so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for your presence and for the Holy Spirit that we have as believers that will empower us and strengthen us, for your word that is true and it provides a strong and solid foundation for us to stand on, for the living hope that you have given us, Lord. The hope and the promise. We can confidently expect your promise to come to pass. Lord, I pray that you would remind us in this short life to be investing in eternal things, to be investing in our souls, for where our treasure is, our heart will be also. Please guide our hearts to you. As we look over these questions, God, I pray that you will give us the strength to answer honestly, and that you will give us the strength to stand and go another day because we know that you are with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.